which will go to support Ukrainian scholars, writers, and artists who have been affected by this terrible war. Using the money raised, Antasha will create residential and non-residential scholarships, which will enable grantees to continue their important work, even in the conditions of war. And you can see actually the link to donate to that fund and describing that fund uh, fully in the chat. If you enjoy our series of webinars, please contribute to our fundraiser so we can support our Ukrainian colleagues and preserve Ukraine's cultural and intellectual potential. Um, there's actually an upcoming event on Friday, April 29th, and the Shah will host the Shevchenko Expertise Athon um, for Ukraine, which will be an eight hour marathon of panels during which our members of Antash Shah will talk about the war and how their particular expertise helps us understand it. And there'll be panels about literature and history and political science, medicine, art, et cetera, um, and uh, scholar rescue, cultural heritage preservation, volunteering, humanitarian aid. Um, many topics will be covered and it actually promises to be the largest gathering of Entesha members perhaps ever in a single event and money raised during the event will benefit this Shevchenko Emergency Fund. So please put that in your calendars, please think about attending and please do think about donating to this important fund. Um, so our event today um, is a wonderful occasion to celebrate um, the publication of a book, um, Painting in Excess, Kiev's Art Revival 1985 to 1993, published by Rutgers University Press. And this is the exhibition catalog and book coming from um, an important exhibition that was curated by Olena Martinuk. Um, and we were just talking about how, um, I don't know quite what the word is, ironic, um, meaningful. It is that this exhibit opened in November of last year and it just closed actually April 12th um, at the Zimmerli Museum at Rutgers. And it's an exhibit about um, Ukrainians art at the dawn of independence, Ukrainian art during Perestroika. Um, and is a wonderful um, exhibit that Olena curated. And she is the editor of this book that we will be discussing today, um, along with two of the book's contributing authors, Alisa Lozhkina and Asia Bazdryeva. Um, we will also be joined by Anastasia Yevseyeva from the Ukrainian Institute. So let me just briefly introduce our speakers. We'll hear from them. And then if you have questions, please put your questions in the Q&A function, which is located at the bottom of your screen and hopefully we'll have time for discussion. So, um, Olena Martinyuk is an art historian from Ukraine. She has um, an MA in cultural studies from Kyiv Mohila and her PhD is from Rutgers University. And she's currently the Petroyatsik postdoctoral research fellow at the Harriman Institute at um, Columbia. And she is the author editor of this book and the curator of this um, exhibit. Um, Alisa Lozhkina is finishing her PhD at Central European University, CEU, currently in Vienna. Um, she is an independent Ukrainian curator, art historian, and critic currently located um, in the San Francisco Bay Area. Her book, uh, Permanent Revolution, Art in Ukraine, the 20th to the early 21st century is wonderful and exists not only in Ukrainian, but also in English and in French. And Asia Bazdriva is an art historian and filmmaker um, in Ukraine, in Kiev right now, um, who is a Fulbright scholar from 2015 to 2017 uh, with an MA from CUNY in um, New York and is the co-author of a project called Geo Cinema um, that explores the possibilities of a planetary notion of cinema. Um, we also have with us Anastasia Yevseyeva, um, from the Ukrainian Institute and the Ukrainian Institute um, under the Ukrainian um, Institute of Foreign Affairs, a Ministry of Foreign Affairs um, uh, has contributed to the publication of this book and Anastasia will speak about um, the importance of supporting um, Ukrainian culture and art um, in this time. So I will now turn the floor over um, to Olena to speak about this book and everything that it means. Thank you so much, Olena. Thank you so much, Mayhil, for this wonderful introduction. And thank you so much, uh, and Desha for hosting this event and uh, for their interest to this publication. And uh, I'm just going to show this book, uh, of which I'm really proud, because uh, when um, we sometimes think about exhibition catalogs, they are 
uh, mostly checklist and uh, little text, but uh, uh, this book uh, uh, and uh, thanks to uh, the a collaborative effort from the Ukrainian Institute and um, um, multiple funds that contributed from uh, the Zimmerli Art Museum uh, uh, to make this catalog really into a book. And uh, it's a very dire need, in fact, to uh, document um, multiple um, pages in Ukrainian history because uh, we recently celebrated 30 years of independence and uh, uh, there is um, uh, still a very um, obvious lack of um, uh, historicization of certain epochs. And this epoch in particular, this period, it was uh, this moment of uh, exhilaration. It was the moment of uh, a fervent speed uh, of when uh, artworks of gigantic scale were created uh, uh, so fast, but unfortunately, what happened that uh, they were sold internationally. Uh, there were many exhibitions uh, in European countries which never came back uh, to Ukraine. And uh, so the artworks were irretrievably lost. Sometimes they were sold without even documentation. Uh, so um, for many years since I was working um, in, in galleries, uh, and uh, like since the uh, uh, beginning and middle of 2000s in Kyiv, I have heard this legend of Ukrainian perestroika, uh, this, which launched uh, uh, the Ukrainian contemporary art, but it was mostly really legends uh, which were spread orally. And uh, I've heard that there were some rare catalogs somewhere, but uh, I've never seen them. And uh, we are talking really about uh, major Ukrainian artists that were defining this um, uh, art field for Ukraine, but there was such a woesome um, lack of knowledge about them. So uh, in a certain way, uh, uh, this book uh, is a kind of a, a, a letter to myself in the past when I'm uh, imagining if I were this young uh, art manager of some gallery and I wanted to find out about um, this period, then I would uh, uh, provide uh, this type of information. So I'm very, very proud uh, that uh, we were able to uh, gather this wonderful team of authors um, and Alexander Solovyov is now in Kyiv. Uh, also a very important figure of that period who witnessed this. Uh, so we have four scientific essays, we have documents, um, we have some photo documentary photographs in this book printed, some artistic statements. So uh, apart from checklist um, uh, of this exhibition, there is this wealth of resources and uh, I'm really, really uh, thankful for the Ukrainian Institute uh, who um, contributed because uh, this book uh, really turned out very lavish. I did not even expect it's a very like hard copy with a beautiful paper and very nice quality illustrations. So thank you, thank you all. And in general about this exhibition, I really wanted to tell about this Ukrainian spirit when um, it was really uh, such a wonderful collaborative effort. There were a group of art collectors. There was Abramovich Art Foundation. There was a Timofey Foundation. Uh, there were uh, people who contributed uh, for the loans who were delivered from Ukraine. Uh, people who contributed for the insurance being paid. Um, uh, so, uh, I think it's just evidence uh, how much Ukrainians, uh, they realize this need uh, of visibility even before uh, this uh, fully scale war and atrocity happened, that uh, both on state and private level, we just really, really want to be uh, heard, known, understood and uh, we, are really uh, working hard uh, on this. And uh, 
I really hope that uh, our efforts, however hampered by this atrocious war, will continue uh, despite everything. Uh, so, uh, after, yes, sorry for this emotional introduction, but uh, uh, let me now talk a little bit about perestroika and uh, the period of the collapse of the Soviet Union, because uh, why this uh, moment is important for the Ukrainian art. Uh, it, was, uh, it was the time, and let me start sharing my screen uh, so that I can Let's have a PowerPoint ready. Um, so why Perestroika? Um, uh, it was this moment um, when Ukrainian art received uh, uh, such an amazing visibility, uh, both um, in Ukraine, in the Soviet Union, uh, internationally. There was so much interest because it hit so many important marks. First of all, uh, there was this country emerging, country in the making. Second of all, uh, somehow uh, this major uh, style which uh, developed in Kiev, uh, this exuberant, a large scale um, neo-expressionist painting, uh, painting somehow uh, became so um, uh, coterminous with um, a world processes. So suddenly um, um, they were compared to the Italian trans avant garde and uh, 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 German neo expressionism. So, um, but um, uh, nobody knew anything about uh, the local implications of the stylistic choices. And still, this is something that um, uh, international public at large is not aware of and which hopefully uh, this book, uh, uh, this lack of uh, this book amends this lack of knowledge. Uh, so uh, during uh, during Perest Perestroika was a paradoxical time because it was uh, simultaneously uh, um, centered around uh, this amazing explosion of styles, of rediscovered histories, of uh, this uh, idea of freedom, of um, uh, finally um, a Ukrainian public sphere became less ideologized. Um, um, the censorship was um, becoming obviously less and less um, um, active in the public sphere. Uh, but um, despite of what um, the last uh, uh, Communist Party secretary of the Soviet Union, Mikhail Gorbachev, was hoping for, uh, for the rejuvenation and um, kind of uh, new utopian horizons for the Soviet Union, uh, in many ways, Perestroika turned out uh, to be about the past and uh, about um, in Ukraine, uh, basically this Pandora box was opened with all the traumas and um, uh, purges, executed Renaissance, Holodomor, all these discussions suddenly poured um, in um, all media. In um, uh, finally, there were initiatives to discuss, for instance, uh, Baychuk. Uh, a group execution and so on and so forth. So these two uh, uh, kind of uh, forces which were uh, directing uh, perestroika are really fully visible uh, in uh, this exhibition and uh, in this catalog. Uh, so um, I have selected this um, uh, lithograph by Sergei Yakutovich, uh, who comes from uh, this artistic family, his father, or he was um, uh, an artist for Sergei Parajanov's uh, movie, Shadows of Forgotten Ancestors, um, and Sergei Yakutovich, uh, um, um, even though he was not a member of um, 
any group on which um, this exhibition is centered, but uh, in many ways, I believe uh, some of his lithographs from the time really captures the spirit, this dynamism, this acceleration. And if you see on this lithograph, uh, they dedicated to peace bicycle ra race, which happened in 86. And this is the year when Chernobyl catastrophe happened, uh, when uh, uh, basically uh, Yakutovich is depicting uh, the moment in the aftermath of this catastrophe when people were on the streets and uh, despite uh, uh, the danger and um, which was uh, completely hushed uh, by the authorities and um, and uh, so even though we see this kind of exaltation uh, and uh, some uh, landmark uh, uh, landscapes of Kiev are included like uh, Bogdan Khmelnytsky monument uh, but um, and some uh, happy faces but look at this face of the old lady who is uh, uh, kind of sudden counterbalance to this uh, exhilaration. And um, this contrastive approach uh, uh, to uh, perestroika is uh, kind of, is visible in many uh, of the artworks in this exhibition. And um, uh, another very, very big important traits of perestroika uh, and it harks back to uh, avant-garde generation, uh, is this necessity uh, to establish certain continuity with history. And um, uh, during this time, artists are very, very actively digging um, Ukrainian Baroque, uh, Ukrainian avant-garde, and uh, also trying to um, answer to these questions uh, like um, what is what does it mean to be a Ukrainian artist? Um, why um, there is uh, uh, so little known about uh, us uh, Ukrainians in the world, and um, uh, and I think this is uh, this uh, desire to establish this continuity uh, is what makes uh, this period so exceptional. Um, uh, Arsen Savadov and Jorge Senchenko, uh, they were uh, sometimes working collaboratively, sometimes uh, individually, uh, but their style is uh, perhaps um, the most characteristic uh, of um, uh, them and a certain group of, um, and several groups of artists, like uh, artists of, uh, the, uh, of the Paris Commune, which was the alternative artistic space, the artistic art squad, um, with the um, building uh, which was closed for renovation and settled by the artists. So what we see here is uh, this contemplation of um, certain historical ruins, um, and um, kind of fragments of civilization, in particular um, European civilization, so Egyptian, um, antique um, uh, culture are a very important. Uh, and, I, and I believe artists in Ukraine were eager to establish uh, this connection to European civilization. And um, uh, it was very, um, uh, was very, uh, important for them to claim uh, part in it. Um, but their we uh, most well-known artwork of the period was Cleopatra Soro. And uh, this artwork was not included in the exhibition, but of course it's featured in catalog. It's a legendary artwork. Uh, it became uh, very well-known after the uh, 1986 um, All Youth Exhibition in, in Moscow, where it generated a huge scandal uh, even prompting uh, this uh, uh, Stalin era uh, art historian uh, uh, Vladimir Kemenov uh, from Moscow to comment on uh, this artwork um, in uh, newspaper Pravda as uh, uh, about the symptom of uh, everything 
uh, which was the worst uh, and which was happening in the Soviet art, in his opinion. And of course, uh, uh, well, there was a, a big scandal and many official press followed uh, uh, in their scathing critiques, critique. I mean, while all liberally minded took it as a sign that this is some kind of wonderful art and indeed, uh, uh, since it was not just a singular art piece, uh, it was like an entire uh, new terrain uh, this, uh, which was discovered together with it. Uh, so um, it really, uh, in a way, became the herald of this uh, new generation. And what uh, Savadov and Senchenko are depicting, they're depicting this last pharaoh uh, of Egypt. Uh, they're talking about the end of the civilization, this deserted landscape, um, uh, the erupted volcano uh, speaks about it. So this woman very warrior is about to charge in a battle, but we don't see either adversary or her troops. Who is she calling to battle? We uh, are not aware, but we see this poisonously green sky behind her and uh, perhaps being reminded of the uh, nuclear a catastrophe and uh, uh, also uh, the tiger is uh, a citation perhaps of uh, the endangered species series by Andy Warhol and uh, uh, pop art was, uh, was quite important for this generation even though uh, their um, style was much uh, kind of uh, painterly um, a gestural and freedom uh, pop art, but uh, there was such a big need to uh, catch up with history. So all this global depository of styles um, was explored with Ukrainian by Ukrainian artists together with their own local history. Yuri Senchenko, and this is our this artwork is really um, one of. Uh, other legends uh, of that period, and it's in Zimmerli collection, and it's on view. Um, I'm showing here in PowerPoint, uh, uh, like when it was just uh, um, uncovered, but uh, now it's restored. It's uh, in wonderful condition. It's a humongous artwork. Uh, it's so overwhelming in size uh, and. Uh, when you think about its origin, it's actually based on a very, very tiny a drawing by Peter Bruegel, the elder, and uh, it's uh, um, dedicated to beekeepers and a, a nest thief. And it's a moral fable uh, about um, the, um, again, a contrast of um, honest labor and uh, a thieving. And, uh, and uh, obviously, Don Ginchik, Senchenko uh, is uh, commenting on socialist realism, um, dictum to uh, depict uh, laboring people. Uh, These heroes of labor were one of the main uh, topics um, of official uh, Soviet art. And um, of course, uh, these young artists who are, were so much protesting uh, to their education, uh, to uh, this uh, official norms imposed on them, but they were still uh, kind of in the grips uh, of uh, uh, this education and this tradition in which uh, they were brought up as students and to which, uh, in which they wanted kind of shed uh, like old skin. Uh, but uh, for, uh, for me, I also see uh, some hints at the um, Chernobyl catastrophe in this artwork uh, because these uh, beekeeper figures they strangely are reminiscent of some kind of um, uh, cosmonauts, uh, but also of um, the liquidators um, uh, of uh, the Chernobyl catastrophe. Uh, and liquidators that's how in Ukraine they were called those uh, firemen. Um, military men uh, who were called to uh, uh, like prevent contamination and they worked um, in the, in the uh, Chernobyl in their protective gear and perhaps uh, for uh, the contemporary onlooker 
uh, who would observe this uh, artwork in the next youth exhibition in Moscow, 1988, uh, where Ukrainians were presented like a big uh, separate gallery for the first time, uh, kind of disrupting this false uh, unity of the Soviet art. Um, so probably for the contemporary observers of this piece, uh, uh, this connection to uh, Chernobyl was more obvious. Um, yes, yeah, some uh, more um, artworks by Savadov um, and Ole um, Holosi um, was like uh, a star of the Paris Commune Art Squad. Uh, died very young, uh, extremely talented, and um, um, we we see this um, uh, on this piece. Uh, uh, the introduction to kind of dominating um, trends uh, in this art squad, uh, namely a combination of some uh, esoteric spirituality and symbols of the other world uh, with um, a bit of um, kind of childhood cartoonish mentality. And um, uh, this um, piece from private collection in Ukraine encapsulates this wonderfully. Um, uh, also, uh, uh, there were um, uh, Alexander Ruedburt, uh, uh, who is in fact Odessa artist, but nevertheless, uh, uh, I included several artworks of him in this exhibition and uh, in the catalog, uh, because he was an active visitor of this Paris Commune Art Squad, who, uh, collaborated with an artist and um, uh, uh, so collage is one of the big um, um, style, uh, big medium explored by the artist and uh, uh, here I'm showing you also Anatoly Stepanenko uh, and uh, he is uh, presented by the series of collages and uh, he was a pioneer of body art, performance art, also uh, beginning even earlier than uh, uh, Perestroika, but these are from uh, this period. And um, uh, during last couple of weeks, when I was given uh, uh, tours in the uh, tours in Zimmerli, and um, I was looking at his artworks, I was extremely concerned because there was this moment because Anatoly Stepanenko, he lives in Irpin, and which is one of the suburbs of Kyiv, where all this terrible atrocity happened and well, during Russian occupation. And um, um, people lost contact with Stepanenko, nobody knew whether he was able to escape or not, and um, artists were looking for him, and um, it was uh, such a uh, intense um, worry for him and I, it was very difficult um, to look at this wonderful art without knowing what is going on with the artist and only recently we learned that uh, he survived, he was able to escape to Kyiv but unfortunately his house was burned and um, he lost um, his studio and his collection so um, we are talking about artists who are still uh, active contributing um, members of Ukrainian cultural sphere, and um, they are definitely affected greatly by the current situation. Vasily Tsagalov was the artist of Paris Commune Art Squad who explored um, um, video art, uh, performances, um, um, photography and uh, these were made as a um, very witty collage series, but um, uh, with um, big philosophical allusions uh, in this project world without ideas, hinting at Plato, a world of ideas. Uh, and now I'm going to uh, the next group, uh, which uh, uh, we are present uh, in this exhibition. And these were the artists of the painterly preserve group. And these were um, actually the artists who 
we are exploring abstract um, art and uh, they uh, were eager to establish the severed connection to uh, avant-garde and even though in the 80s um, abstract art was not uh, the main trend um, they were willing to go against this grain uh, just because uh, well, Ukrainian situation uh, of this disjoint uh, generations uh, was uh, deeply troubling for them, and uh, they felt like this uh, story um, was still not uh, written. And um, um, Asia will speak more about this group uh, la today later. Tiberi Silvashi was one of was uh, there, like unofficial leader, and. Uh, uh, here uh, we see several of his artworks in which uh, the color gradually um, becoming the main subject and uh, uh, starts to dominate uh, the painting, um, uh, gradually swallowing the subject matter. Anatoly Krivolap uh, was uh, uh, a very important figure back then and still one of the leading abstract artists in uh, Ukraine uh, who would um, explore the metaphysics of Ukrainian landscape in his um, abstraction. Uh, and uh, also another group uh, or which emerged during Perestroika where uh, was a group uh, with a title which was very postmodern and ironic the resolute edge of post-national eclecticism. And it was comprised of um, Rionov, Konstantin Rionov, Oleg Tisto, who were the co-founders of this group. Uh, and they were uh, exploring the national myths and symbols. And uh, they were connected to uh, both neo-expressionist and conceptual art uh, trends. Mm. Uh, Marina Skugariva was also part of this group who worked um, a bit in Moscow, famous for money art squad. And here clearly Marina is exploring a Baroque tradition and also Ukrainian folk tradition as when she combines painting and embroidery on her canvases. Um, uh, also Yana Bostrova was a member of uh, this group uh, and um, um, here it's uh, both also um, exploration of some uh, spiritual uh, and religious symbols. Uh, 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 a wonderful um, artwork from uh, early um, 90s by Mikola Matsenko and Oleg Tistol, who started to develop uh, further the work of this group uh, under the uh, auspices of the program NATSPROM, which is national industry. Uh, it's another very um, big, uh, li like large scale composition, which comprised you see, uh, several uh, separate pieces, uh, but it depicts um, the story of the Warsaw Peace, where Pilsudski and Petlura signed a, a very short lived uh, treaty. And uh, uh, they um, examine uh, this historical moment of a brief uh, unity um, uh, in postmodern terms using uh, multiple um, new techniques, uh, including uh, the ready-made stencil uh, medium of, uh, with, for which they used uh, the Soviet era uh, lace curtains, like you see uh, here. Um, and, uh, and one little gallery, which is situated in the center of this exhibition, is dedicated to cave artists who worked in the 60s, 70s. Uh, and uh, this is a testimony to, again, um, uh, this disjointed, uh, um, nature of Ukrainian art, since uh, many of these artists um, really worked uh, um, um, completely 
unknown to the general public. Um, there was even a famous title given to some of them, uh, like uh, Grigory Gavrilenko, a Kiev Hermits. So this um, uh, artist didn't have access to the public. Um, uh, or uh, some artists were vocal dissidents and um, they suffered from persecutions, harassments, and um, when their artwork was uh, destroyed and um, artists like Ala Horska uh, physically eliminated, uh, she was killed by KGB in 1970. And uh, this artwork, uh, uh, Silence, uh, well, prominently featuring colors of the Ukrainian flag, uh, is uh, both a personification of Ukraine and kind of self-portrait of the artist. Uh, um, Florian Yuryev um, was also a very important um, a figure of the 60s and 70s, uh, lived until last year, and he's a famous um, architect of one of the endangered modernist building in Kiev right now. Uh, so th that's a very, very brief introduction, but I really hope it shows um, the wealth of um, this still um, not yet fully explored um, at, um, groups and uh, basically each individual artist presented here merits uh, a solo show and uh, I really hope um, uh, that this exhibition and this uh, wonderful catalog which remains as a material testimony to the exhibition uh, will bring aware awareness and also will encourage a generations, uh, well, not generations, but I mean, uh, encourage scholars to study um, Ukrainian art. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, um, Olena. Um, thank you for this beautiful um, presentation. Um, thank you for this overview of the exhibition. I already have so many questions um, for you. I love this idea of this work being legends when you first started working on this period and you've been able to bring it out of the world of legend and into the sort of material object of this book. So thank you so much. Um, it's really wonderful. I will turn the floor over to Alisa. Thank you so much, Mayhill. Yeah, thank you so much, Olena, uh, first of all, for this very important exhibition, because now we are in the situation when we desperately need uh, visibility of Ukrainian culture and art, and we are not existing now uh, according to the rules that were uh, here till February 24th. Now it's the new time, and of course, as people who are... Uh, dealing with Ukrainian art, we know how, how much it can tell about uh, Ukraine, how much it can tell about our independence, how much it can tell about our identity, our struggle for this identity and our otherness, which is again, the big, uh, the big thing because it's being discussed everywhere. It's being doubted by uh, President Putin who uh, is currently attacking Ukraine. And of course, all our hopes and dreams and thoughts are in Ukraine, no matter where we are. And of course, we are uh, we are now uh, in the situation when when it's very hard to predict the future. It's the only thing that we can tell today is just we want to stop the war. We want the world to know about Ukraine, about Ukrainian art, and we are doing as much as we can to 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 tell the story of Ukraine through art. And I want to thank uh, particularly Asa Bazdereva, who is uh, today. Uh, joining us from Kiev, and uh, I hope um, I hope she's safe. But it's very hard to to, to you know to even pronounce such such words uh, today. So in this situation, such exhibitions as Olana's, no matter I mean I was witnessing uh, how this exhibition was being prepared, and we were so heartbroken that there was this delay with uh, due to COVID uh, with the opening of this exhibition, and uh, it was such a such a such a big uh, disaster for Olana who dreamt about this exhibition for 
for years. And now it appeared that, you know, there was some logic in the universe for this uh, exhibition to appear right now, right here, because uh, especially in the United States with the lack of information about Ukrainian art, with the lack of projects, serious projects, exhibition projects about Ukrainian art, it's really a, a gift of, uh, I don't know, universe that uh, uh, in the moment when there was such a huge uh, visibility of Ukraine and such a huge interest to, towards Ukraine, there was this exhibition. Of course, uh, nowadays we are all speaking about the necessity of the, the colonial optics and dealing with uh, Uk Ukrainian art and Soviet art and uh, Russian imperial art. And I think in this in this situation, the artworks that are were, were exhibited there were particularly important and uh, uh, and relevant. And uh, of course, uh, it's my special pleasure that uh, there is this book because as a person who, who made many exhibitions without catalogs, I know how, how horrible it feels when, when this butterfly, beautiful butterfly just flies away without leaving any trace of its existence. And it's almost impossible to, 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 to tell people that, you know, it, it, it was so awesome. So uh, in this aspect, I think that the, the books and especially the books, because today we don't need like uh, catalogs and this classical uh, understanding of this world where we just have images. Today, it's much more important to speak about uh, the artworks that, that were included into the show and to give some more coherent like narrative and explanation of the general context of the appearance of these uh, works. And I also want to thank, of course, uh, Anastasia and Ukrainian Institute, who, uh, in no matter how difficult the situation is, is still uh, uh, doing their best uh, to promote Ukrainian culture and to support Ukrainian culture. I mean, they all exist in this very precarious and uh, dangerous situation today, but still, uh, this is one of the most, uh, I think, active wings of Ukrainian uh, cultural froth frontline and uh, battle nowadays uh, and I am really happy that they uh, they managed to support this uh, very important edition and I'm uh, uh, going uh, to my uh, presentation uh, which deals with the very uh, difficult issue because um, Ukrainian art is full of ruptures as well as Ukrainian history and uh, Today, we are witnessing the situation of one more trauma, which can and sh will inevitably bring one more rupture. Uh, and uh, as, as citizens, of course, we have to, and we, we can have our opinion about what is happening. And as art historians, uh, we must study uh, not only the ruptures, but also the connections and this uh, thin threads that connect different uh, eras in Ukrainian art. And today I will be speaking about a complicated topic, which today in the context of the ongoing war between uh, Russia and Ukraine is particularly complicated because I'm speaking about the connections between the art of uh, perestroika in Ukraine, this new wave of art, which is like, it's so easy to present this new wave of something brand new, which appears just on this like, you know, uh, burned ground. And it's just like this beautiful flowers growing from nowhere. It's a very beautiful poetic metaphor, but uh, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, life is a little bit more complicated and uh, it doesn't just appear from nowhere. And uh, what I will be sharing is uh, my account of the connections of this new Ukrainian art, which was absolutely important and absolutely uh, specific and unique, of course. But at the same time, it appeared not out of the blue. It has its historical uh, connections and roots in the art of the previous epochs. I'll share my screen. One second. Okay. Okay, so the latest Ukrainian art uh, is the result of a historical rupture. Modern artistic practices were conceived in the late Soviet Union in opposition to the socialist realism that had outlived itself. However, the Soviet art system proved to be rather more tenacious than the Soviet Union itself. 
Even to this day, in independent Ukraine, the infrastructure of modern art still exists side by side with the remnants of the old system. The Union of Artists created in the Soviet era still operates, and the spirit of aggressive conservatism in, is dominant in Ukraine's main artistic university, namely the National Academy of Fine Arts and Architecture. Many of the old masters of socialist realism adapted rather well to the new historical conditions. After the fall of the USSR, they painted icons for Orthodox churches and portrayed bandits, businessmen, and new Ukrainian bureaucrats instead of Lenin and collective farmers. Like if in any ideological bedrock, uh, that art rapidly deteriorated. But those artists did not entirely surrender their artistic talent. New art, arising amid the ruins of utopia, announced a clean break with the art of the previous generation of senile fathers, declaring its intention to keep pace with current global trends. The fact mm, that there was such a fundamental break with Soviet tradition and that this break was proclaimed so relentlessly, accompanied by a hostility lasting for many years to any Soviet remnants, meant that any objective analysis of the continuum between the first post-perestroika generation and previous generations has been severely hampered. And yet, the connections between the new art and the Soviet art system are rather obvious. This is particularly the case with the Kiev School of Figurative Postmodernist Painting of the late 1980s and early 1990s. Like Odessan conceptualism and the Kharkiv School of Photography, formed in those deeply rich local traditions of nonconformism, art in Kiev, unlike I mean, art in Kiev in the middle and uh, late 1980s had little to do with the local nonconformist scene. In fact, in the mid to late 1980s, any such scene in Kiev was pr practically non-existent. Persecution of all forms of dissidents in the capital of Soviet Ukraine had been far more severe and at the uh, than at the periphery, and even more so than in Moscow. Kiev painting of the late 1980s was closer to the so-called permitted art. Aware that it was no longer able to fully suppress non-conformist trends, the Soviet system permitted an easing of ideological pressure after the 1970s. So from the deepest recesses of, of, of official Soviet art, there emerged artistic phenomena linked to young artists, giving them some space for limited experiments with form. This is the context of the late 1980s in which the Ukrainian new wave was born, following on from the euphoric wave of perestroika. To a certain extent, their art found kindred spirits in the left wing of the Soviet Kiev Union of Artists, comprising figure, figures such as Viktor Ryzhev, Halina Neletva, Akim Levich, and others. The generation belonging to the Ukrainian New Way found itself in favorable, favorable circumstances. It was shaped in an era of radical change. Whereas their forerunners, uh, gingerly uh, and flattering in their approach, would become reticent, uh, these artists had, to, uh, had the chance to shout at the top of their voices. Their rebellious desires resonated with contemporary reality. A critical mass of artists suddenly formed. With their interest in contemporary philosophy and current trends in international art, and united by a vital energy, they seemed to embrace the spirit of an era of hope and rebirth. Students of the Kiev Fine Art Institute formed uh, the backbone of the Ukrainian new wave. Many had previously studied at a Republic Art School. In the USSR, it was deemed that complex technical nuances of fine art had to be grasped at an early age. With this in mind, a whole network of specialized boarding schools was established, and their most talented graduates would go on to enroll at the art institutes. Our sense of art of Georgi Senchenko, whom we already mentioned today, uh, 
Олег Голосій, Олександр Кнеліцький, Валерія Трубіна, Василій Цеголов, Олег Тістел і Микола Маценко were all alumni, alumni of the Soviet art system. From an early age, they studied academic drawing and painting with teachers who had themselves been students of the leading masters of Soviet art, many of whom had been awarded Stalin prizes in 1940s and 1950s and who had defined the agenda of socialist realism at the peak of its development. Mikhailo Khmelko, Viktor Puzirkov, Tetyana Yablonska, Oleksandr Lopukhov, Viktor Shatalin. These teachers were living legends and the bearers of the artistic tradition that had made Kyiv in the late 1940s and early 1950s one of the main centers of the conveyor belt-like production of socialist realist canvases. The artists of the new wave were shaped in a system in which there uh, reigned a def deference to painting as the highest form of artistic expression. Multi-figure canvases, bright colors, an impulse for narrative, sweeping confident brushwork, huge formats, all these features of postmodern Ukrainian painting were inherited from their closest of kin, socialist realism. Young artists of the first post-perestroika generation transmuted traditional form, breathing a radically new content and energy into it. And so, dying out, Ukrainian socialist realism paradoxically breathed life into new art. No matter how the generation of the Ukrainian new wave revolted, experimented with the new media, or tried to suppress the centrality of painting, large-scale figurative painting still haunts it to this day, like a witch spell from a fairy tale. Postmodernism in Ukrainian visual arts is first and foremost post-socialist realism. Here you can see an example of uh, two artworks. One of them was created by this uh, classic of uh, socialist realism, Viktor Shetalin, and uh, it's a battle for Dnieper, like a uh, topic still very, uh, very relevant till now days where it was a huge battle during the World War War, which where like uh, over one million people died. It was one of the biggest tragedies in in in, in the history of contemporary Ukraine. And uh, on the other, uh, it's a it's a giant painting uh, which is now kept in one of uh, small provincial Ukrainian museums, and it's uh, kept so well that it's all. all, all also impossible to to take it out and to take a decent picture uh, so we were when we were pre preparing this uh, book we were trying to 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 convince this museum workers to to get this uh, picture out and they said no no this is too big we are not going to to do it that's why we are offering you just like a, a reproduction from a postcard uh, postcards were a very important medium of uh, how to say it sharing uh, our, our art uh, in the soviet uh, era and on the other side, you can see uh, a very important artwork by uh, the artist from the new wave generation, Vasil Tsagolov, uh, the key figure of the Ukrainian new wave, and a student of uh, Viktor Shetalin. And uh, of course, uh, these artworks have uh, <laughs> have obvious differences, but at the same time, you have to keep it in mind this that uh, the painting of Vasil Tsegolov is around like 10 meters long and uh, it's uh, it's uh, still has like this uh, traces of this approach uh, to this gigantic painting which was uh, taught in the Kiev uh, Art Institute it was called back then this way today it's the National Academy of uh, Art and Architecture of Ukraine so uh, Ukrainian postmodernism engages dynamically with local art history for example, in the works of Oleg Tistel, who belonged to the association uh, Resolute Edge of National Post-Eclectism, there are tangible parallels with the work of Soviet Ukraine's main romantic, Mihaila Derehus, and which many other artists who addressed the topic of Ukraine's distant past. Unlike other representatives of the new wave who embraced the cosmopolitan mythology, the artists of uh, the Resolute Edge of uh, the Resolute Edge gravitated toward exploring national myths. The beauty of the national stereotype was the formula for their main source of inspiration. For Oleg Tistel, the primary stereotype of Ukrainian culture and the object of a deep ironic exploration was the sugar-coated glossy Soviet propaganda of the history of Ukrainian Cossacks. 
Once the USSR collapsed, the narrative of the heroic pre-Soviet past became the leading myth deployed by the adherents of independent Ukraine. The artists of Resolute Edge scrutinized how, having barely slipped from the grasp of one historical myth, Ukraine did its utmost to start building another. In the Yellow Room, uh, painted in 1989, a showpiece worked by Oleg Holosy, the leading representative of the new wave. There seems a first, at first glance to be little alluding to socialist realist classics. However, in Ukrainian art, there was already one famous yellow room. Uh, that is St. George's Hall of the Kremlin Palace in Moscow, depicted on an enormous classical canvas by the socialist realist Mikhail Melko in 1947. The solemn reception of May 24, 1945, in honor of the victory in the Second World War, culminated in the famous toast by Joseph Stalin, to the victory, uh, to the great Russian people. Khmelko's painting is the apotheosis of Stalinist grand style, with its characteristic megalomania, its passion for, for multi-figure art, and the cult of personality for the leader of the US, USSR. Holosey's Yellow Room was part of the revolt against the stuffy ideological spell under which Soviet painting found itself. Like Melko's painting, it combines a colossal format, strident color, and a closed space in which the action takes place. It is a psychedelic eruption into a pretentious grand style, its dissection and elimination with the aid of boorish expression and the new mythology. Committing a Freudian Parasite, the artists of the new wave repeatedly emphasized their radical aversion to Soviet art, rejecting any suggestion that it was part of their DNA. In the late 1980s, they directed their gaze towards the Italian trans avant-garde and the German new savages. At the same time, interested in postmodernist painting, the artist discovered its methodological resemblance with the format la formal language of socialist realism. This correspondence offered them an opportunity to use those skills acquired at Soviet art schools. Later on, by the early 2000s, after years of experiments with new media, this group returned to painting and now quite consciously began to emulate Soviet academic painting. But in the late 1980s and early 1990s, the connection with socialist realism was more unconscious in, ch in character. Another branch of art developed in Kiev in parallel with postmodernism. Here, a group was taking shape whose main focus was attention to plastic abstraction, metaphysics, and the alchemy of the artist's engagement with the painterly surface of the canvas. Artists slightly older than those of the new wave were the backbone of this school. Tiberi Selvashi, Mikola Krivenko, and Anatoly Krivolov were all over 40 at the time of the breakdown of the USSR and were already recognized artists. Painterly preserved as the members of this circle called themselves, did not create collective works of, or manifestos. Rather, they constituted a sphere of communication, a laboratory to generate new meanings. The artists tried to find and formulate their answer to the question of what kind of art should arise after the collapse of ideology. In an era in which a spirit of experimenting with new media reigned, painterly preserve remained loyal to painting, limiting their formal experiments to it. Painterly preserve represents the self-perception of artists in a world where painting was rapidly going out of fashion. The art scholar Alexander Solovyov placed this group on an imaginary equator between the radicalism of the new wave and the retrograde war work of tired late Soviet academism. In a certain sense, painterly preserve did have a stance of reclaiming modernism in Ukrainian art, where its tradition had been interrupted. The artists of painterly preserve restored a continuity between the avant-garde, the unofficial tradition, and the art of the new independent Ukraine. 
the biography of their chief uh, proponent of painterly preserved Tiberi Silva ship is emblematic in terms of the transformation of late Soviet art. In the Soviet era, he was one of the most successful young artists of Soviet Ukraine. In the late 1970s, he became interested in the limits of realist painting, and in early 1990s, he created a series of poetic realistic paintings where the figurative aspect gradually diminished, as seen in the painting Midnight and Guest. After turning to an abstract style in the late 1980s, he started experimenting with pure color. The evolution of the artist from the soft realism of the beginning of the 1980s to the monochrome of his later career stemmed from his careful fumbling for new meanings in an epoch in which the old meanings had lost any currency. On the one hand, this development somewhat exemplifies the complex of one who had always excelled in whatever he did. And if an effective Soviet functionary, famed for his liberalism, would naturally wish to say his piece in the new art of independent Ukraine. Abstraction from the perspective of the late Soviet period was one of the most radical violations of taboos. And yet, works by Silvashi and other painters of the group, with their surfaces covered by pure color, were not just paying tribute to global modernism, but consciously departing from the excessive narrative drive of Soviet art, taking a stance of artistic austerity and creative seclusion. By the time the Soviet Union collapsed, art found itself in a deep inner crisis and on a quest. Effectively, both the new wave and the painterly preserved were timely and exhaustive answers with this, within the system to this crisis. The evolution of both schools toward a westernized contemporary art spared them the crisis and stagnation that befell the most conservative wing of Soviet art. Opting for modernity opened up new horizons and gave an impetus to the birth of an artistic tradition whose equal in force and integrity had arguably not been known since the era of the avant-garde. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elisa. That was such a fascinating presentation and I, I look forward to actually reading the piece in, in, the, in the book as well. I love the story of institutional structures Right. And, and also the difficulty kind of at this moment, the epistemological challenge of talking about Soviet continuities. Right. It's it's very difficult. So thank you so much. Um, Asia, I will pass the baton to you. OK, hi. Uh, hi, Asia. Can hi. you hear me well? We sure can. Yes. Yes, I mean, sometimes my mic tends to be noisy, but uh, if it's the case, let me know so then I can do something with that. Uh, but before I begin, I just quickly, I mean, first of all, thank you everyone for having me here and thanks to Elena for curating the show and editing this book. Um, before I begin, I wanted to quickly say, um, Elena mentioned how she was emotional and of course, I mean, how can we not be emotional today? And um, uh, recently, my colleague, uh, Daria Tsimbaluk, she's working, um, her main uh, area of research is Donbass, and she made a really amazing presentation where she was talking about erasure as an instrument of coloniality. And, you know, I feel very surreal now while participating in the con like art history conference now, and um, it's like the least, probably the least, uh, I mean, I was not able to produce any academic or artistic work uh, for the past two months. But then again, because um, erasure is an instrument of coloniality and this is why what we do now is ever more pressing because kind of like we tried, but we try not to be erased when there are all these kind of circumstances that try to otherwise uh, erase us. So as much as this is surreal for me to be here today, but uh, uh, nevertheless, I'm glad and I'm happy to participate. So now let me share my screen. Here. So now you can see it, right? Maybe I should file. I completely forgot how to make presentations recently. View slideshow. Yes. And a quick note is also like here on the slide, it says back to empty landscape, landscapes. 
Uh, but initially, or in the book, um, this paper is called Back and Down to Empty Landscapes. And I guess the main, uh, or at the core of my paper is the temporal and spatial aspect of modernity as it happened in the Soviet, or especially in the post-Soviet time, and it, as it has been reinvented by the painterly preserve, of which I will be talking today. So um, initially, uh, when Olena invited me to contribute to this book, I was asked to focus on a very particular topic, which was abstract painting as it emerged in the late 80s and early 90s. And as mentioned before, it was a small circle of artists called Painterly Preserve, Zhivopisny uh, Zapovednik. And uh, this group was facilitated by Tiberi Silvashi, who would organize the activities of this group. He would try to write some sort of conceptual agenda and who would also make attempts to write a program for Painterly Preserve by bridging early Soviet and Western European avant-garde with their current attempts to work the visual language that they were developing. Um, Silva Shi himself uh, would reiterate somehow popular thesis in the post-Soviet artistic climate of ideas that the USSR and its uh, uniformed method of socialist realism has been interrupted or the social realism has interrupted the natural development of avant-garde visuality. So in the late uh, 80s, when the USSR was disintegrating um, and the artists were relieved of the pressure of heavily ideolo ideology, ideologized visual language. And so this was the moment where they could relink themselves to say Malevich or Kandinsky and continue that uh, conceptual direction. I will unpack this slightly later, but uh, what I want to begin with is that um, when I hear about this kind of rupture or disruptured lineage of history of abstract painting or other types of um, art in Ukraine. And this is a very popular thesis about ruptures. And for me, uh, this is a place of doubt. And I guess my paper is a, some sort of an anti-thesis to this idea of rupture. So obviously now in 2021, uh, we cannot align a multiverse of artistic expressions that happened in various forms across the globe along a single line of art history. So this kind of lineage of modernity as one narrative is already a place of doubt. And also this kind of lineage is um, rendered through Eurocentric terms. And this is why especially we have to doubt this uh, line of narrative. So there are many modernisms, there are many times, there are many contexts that make seemingly identical abstract squares and circles mean very different things. And I guess this will be my point today that the circles and squares and other things, other types of geometry in the abstract painting as it emerged at the end of the 80s, early 90s, meant completely different things as opposed to um, kind of the earlier, um, the earlier avant-garde. So my task, as I formulated it for myself, was to propose an alternative way of looking at these works methodologically by situating them in a particular historical and ideological context in which they emerged. So this was research um, that combined social art history plus cultural studies. I worked through primary sources, including catalogs of painterly preserves exhibition in the early 90s. I've interviewed artists themselves, as well as curators and researchers who worked around that time. And I was interested in understanding both the ideological climate of the time, but more so, I was interested in the material aspects of their life and work at the time. What was their access in terms of ideas, travels, and resources? Just to give you a bit of a context, the Painterly Preserve was a group of artists. Initially, they were Alexander Babak, Marko Heiko, Pavlo Kereste, Mykola Krivenko, Anatoly Krivolap, uh, Sergei Semerin, Tiberi Silvashi, e, uh, and Alexander Zhivatkov. And uh, they have united for three subsequent exhibitions, uh, which uh, with the first one opening in 1992, by the second show, the group has already receded, each of them ultimately taking their solo path in 1995 already. So it was just very few years when they collaborated. The formation of the group was mostly due to Tiberi Silvashi's enthusiasm against the backdrop of, already, of an already changing political climate in 
1987, already, he was already an established artist at the time. Um, and he was appointed secretary of the youth section of the Union of Artists. And as some of you might know, in the USSR since 1932, all production and legitimization of arts was centralized under the Union of Artists. In order to get a membership in the Union of Artists, each artist would have to submit works to be then selected for the regional and republic exhibitions. So as soon as Silvashi was in the position to hold um, regular um, review of selected works for the Republican exhibitions, as he recalled, um, he recognized that there was this distinctive presence of what, what he called uh, the new language. So he was reviewing these works of arts and he was kind of taking notes of this new language that was appearing among young artists. And since he had access to administrative resources, he wanted to mobilize those in order to create a secure space for the development of that kind of painting that he noted and that kind of language. So he organized artistic residencies in the small town of Sedniv, uh, known for its very uh, pictorial countryside landscapes. During the Soviet period, uh, Sedniv co-hosted um, uh, so-called houses of artistic creativity that provided stipends for seasonal plan airs under the aegis of Union of Artists. And Silvashi secured the possibility for a particular group that he selected um, together with Alexander Solovyov. And so they would do the seasonal trips that would later become known as Sedniv 88, 89, and 91. So these were the first laboratories, and Alisa mentioned that before, that the kind of the space for communication and development of ideas. And these laboratories uh, heralded a group of abstract painters that would be later called painterly preserve. Um, when I asked uh, Tiberi Silvashi to describe what he meant by the new language, uh, he started with a memory, a very particular memory that was important for him as well. Uh, in the end of the 60s, when Silvashi was a student, and he was a student of Grigory uh, Havrilenko, who is a very uh, prominent Soviet uh, painter. So he attended a massive exhibition pavilion near the October Palace in Kiev. And so this October Palace was hosting an over-the-top show of uh, Soviet art. And the interior spaces, uh, as you can imagine, were ordered by the importance. So there were few rooms. And uh, so you had hundreds of gigantic uh, images of revolutionary heroes and leaders, uh, leaders of socialist labor, et cetera, et cetera. So, and they were kind of ordered by importance. So in the first room, massive works of heroes and then workers, et cetera, et cetera. And then he recalls, Silvashi recalls that he went into the very kind of final room. And this was the room where all the rest was placed, like not so important, not so heroic, not so huge. And he recalls that he was just fascinated. He saw a small painting and he was complete, completely mind blown when he saw it. And so it was essentially kind of abstract. And you see the fragment of this painting. It was called The Beach by Grigory Gavrilenko. And so it was like almost this abstract painting. But when you look at this, you immediately recognize the uh, Trukhanev Island so that you could see the, uh, the Dnipro River and then the beach and then the... Um, the greenery. And so it was very familiar at the same time. It, it was very um, related to a particular geography and particular landscape. At the same time, uh, it was abstract. And he said that um, as opposed to all this ideologically colored paintings that were aligned with the party agenda, and they were already hardly convincing by that time, you know, so like by the end of the, like in the 60s, 70s, 80s, all this like propaganda paintings were already Kind of turned into kitsch and uh, when he saw this one the tiny painting so he felt that it was something authentic and despite a humble scale and means of expressions that Haverlenko used in this painting it did speak louder than all these grand narratives of soviet history in the exhibition altogether so the new language which i asked him about the new language was this kind of search for this different type of authenticity and the one that was free of Soviet socio-political conventions and instead something that was able to focus on creative drive and search for a new expression. 
Um, this immediately echoes the early 20th century claims for creative autonomy and art for the art's sake. Of course, this is a very obvious parallel, but this kind of like attempt that Silvashi or this kind of drive that Silvashi had to kind of secure the space where art is free from the agenda and can just focus on whatever the creative drive of the art is. And even the title of this newly formed group, Painterly Preserve, bore this notion of a cordoned off and protected area where painting could be safe. Silva Shi would later say that the history of painting was already too much affected by the Soviet past and post-Soviet present. He imagined a place instead where art could find refuge when the quote, exhausted and now dated language of cultural codes becomes empty and one needs to come back to their origins. And this is important, the, the comeback to the origins. So the preserve was a metaphor of um, antecedence, the place where nature remains untouched by culture. And this is already, and I will unpack this later, but it's already kind of um, contains this paradox, right? If we speak about the modernism in like early 20th century, at the core of it was this disruption with nature and kind of going to the future. But here we have a different type of modernism that instead was like disrupting this kind of idea of Soviet modernity and wanted to come back to a place which is untouched by um, culture. Um, following the first painterly preserve exhibition in 1992 and onwards, Silva, she was keen to articulate painterly preserves direction through the lens of early 20th century modernism. And he would make many attempts to shape the program of the group. And so for that, he was doing this mix of uh, kind of something that he took from Havrelenko's legacy, and then he was mixing it for, with something else that he would read from Clement Greenberg's text and bits of philosophical thoughts that he would retrieve from art journals that were smuggled through the through the iron or from behind the iron curtain. And uh, Silva she recalls that he had this access to Western magazines because he lived in the Western Ukraine. It was still possible somehow. Uh, get some information even when it was kind of prohibited in the rest of the, uh, Ukraine. So the painterly preserves early works were indeed sometimes inspired by episodic encounters with works of Western artists. For example, if you look at Heiko's work, he was kind of discovering Georgia Morandi. If you look um, kind of at Krivenko's work, you could see the parallels with his discovery of William de Kooning, et cetera, et cetera. Or like many of them would be kind of in this a uh, never-ending dialogue with Malevich or Kandinsky. Uh, Silva Shi himself started with figurative painting, and you saw it in Olena's and uh, Alisa's presentation already. But in the 80s, he was already gravitating towards abstraction. And he was kind of inheriting Havrilenko's interest in the materiality of color and light. And this is also important because in Havrilenko's work, it's very linked to the materiality of soil and light, particularly in Ukraine. And uh, a full transition for um, Silva Shi happened after 1988, when while on an exchange visit to the United States, he encountered the works of Mark Rothko. And this eventually inspired a series of abstract painting called Fields. But again, uh, if in the Rothko's case, it was this kind of experiment with light, with form and color, but uh, Silva Shi's fields were pretty much linked to the actual, um, to the actual landscapes. For Silva Shi, the marginalized abstraction of the 60s um, was linked to the Soviet avant-garde of the 20s. And so his idea was that, that there was this kind of first attempts to do abstraction in the 20s, then in the 60s, like with Havrilenko, and then it resurfaced in the 80s. So there was this kind of like a situation of disruption, but at the same time continuity. And his main thesis was this kind of like social, socialist realism was interrupting this like natural development of, um, of uh, abstract art. However, this doesn't explain much, I thought. And this is where the temporal gap can be quite instrumental. Abstract painting as it emerged both um, in Western and Soviet modernities was part and parcel of the longer trope of modernity, namely men's uh, supremacy over nature. 
And even though many artists back then have started from mimicking nature, and like we know, for example, for Mondrian, he was like developing his abstraction by kind of actually reproducing a particular landscape that he eventually reduced to just horizontal and vertical lines. And many did the similar thing, and even Kandinsky. And it was interesting, like, for example, when I was reading Kandinsky letters, it was a very kind of short span of time where he dramatically changes his approach. Like he started like, oh, his abstract painting started with, again, imitating nature, but reducing it to particular geometries. But then he completely changed his mind like within five years. And uh, he later wrote that kind of his, uh, or the abstract art that they were working on has nothing to do with nature and can be, and aims to manage without it. So this kind of Kandinsky's and, Mondrian and others. So their path to abstraction gradually changed from the idea of nature as an integral part of abstraction to the idea that abstraction is entirely independent from nature. And this is, we'll see, is completely different for the abstraction which emerges at the end of the 80s, early 90s in Ukraine. But let's stay with uh, nature for a bit. Um, so while some scholars continue to contextualize Soviet history as a radical deviation from the lineage of modernity, the history of the USSR, which is a gigantic geopolitical construct of the 20th century, is precisely a modernist project that evolved out of the Western idea of the rationalization of nature. Soviet ideology was grounded in the modernist idea of a human and human supremacy over nature. And the kind of the main value of this human would be uh, kind of to use or to put to use the vast resources of nature and use them for economic development of the country, as we see in the USSR, or for the individual based on the political agenda. But the idea that man kind of supersedes the nature. Uh, complementing this vision, the early Soviet avant-garde manifested the need to design a new state and a new citizen by disrupting links with nature. And also we know a kind of very famous thesis about Stalin, as a master artist behind his creation, who took this idea to the extreme. And with only a few decades, the Soviet project redrew maps and rewrote lives, dried out seas and reversed rivers, launched off the ground and into the space, accelerated with atomic speeds and exploded with Chernobyl. So this was a very fast development of the project of modernity and it collapsed. So the end of the nineties um, bears witness to a dramatic fold of temporality. The collapse of the Soviet Union as a political and economic model, first of all, and then we see exhausted lands and soon to be disintegrated planned economy. And this proved the failure of this future oriented progress of modernity. So to go back to art, abstract painting as it emerged in the Soviet and post-Soviet time is in fact uh, in the opposition to the strongly political early avant-garde ambition to supersede the nature. Again, the circles of Kandinsky and Mondrian, whose thinking would become formative for Silvashi's artistic articulation, denounced nature and religion to further argue that painting stood for an absolute of art as such, a total disruption with mimetic connection to reality, as well as with the spiritual aspect of it. On the contrary, abstract painting of late Soviet and early independent Ukrainian periods would not fit such an agenda, and it emerged primarily as a synthesis of sorts a rediscovery of land and its rather archaic sense, multiplied by a search for transcendence in a very orthodox way. It was both a spiritual source and a means to escape from politicization of visual language amid growing ideological vacuum. Crucial to highlight the importance of land and soil for the Ukrainian intelligentsia, uh, starting with a national romantic idea that would center the vision of Ukraine's formation based on the fertility of its lands, nourished by generosity of rivers and the sun, and at the same time, the fragility of these territories in the face of colonial invasions. The richness of these lands that throughout century has been a defining factor for social organization of peoples and their cosmological beliefs, while also a profound connection with the lands, all of this gave legacy to folklore that mixed rhapsodies over idyllic villages, village life with laments over those taking advantage of it. A historian, Orest Subtelny, um, emphasized how the early local intelligentsia of the 19th century, which was a handful of highly educated people, 
who were committed to the improvement of the social, cultural, and political situations of peasants, was foundational in the concepts of Ukraine as a nation state. Under the influence of German philosopher uh, Johann Herder, who emphasized the need to study rural life and language for formation of nation, they turned to ethnographic expeditions um, of Ukrainian villages. Over a long duration of Ukrainian history, the country's picturesque landscapes have long been um, a canvas for the construction, construction of its cultural and political identity. And this image that you see here, I mean, it's not directly related to kind of the abstract painting that I was exploring, but you see uh, Alahorska, Ivan Drach, and uh, they were doing this kind of uh, field trips uh, to villages, and they were also kind of um, examining this sites of mass shooting. So there is this link between, again, Ukrainian intelligentsia, this very link to the land, and also to those who were buried in this land. Uh, already in the 60s, um, artists such as Lenko, who was the main inspiration for Silvashi again, so Havrilenko and his peers, um, who would be still commissioned for the socialist realist agenda, uh, they would uh, sought refuge, um, they would seek refuge in their artistic residencies in Kaniv or Sedniv, or by spending their free time in the countryside. Many would go to Carpathian mountains that were, we can say, rediscovered when some worked on Sergei Parajanov's uh, Shadows of Forgotten Ancestors. Uh, Following the example of the early Ukrainian intelligentsia of the 19th century, they all would take to the Ukrainian roads and again collect folk anthologies that would eventually impact their work. So here the land had been a constant throughout the centuries uh, and it reflected the people's growing need for existential self-identification and kind of the way they relate to reality. So the land, which was muted by industrial regimes of the Soviet time, and the narratives that drove those regimes, um, the land eventually attracted artists as a primary matter, a starting point for their silent contemplation. And this was precisely what was happening by the end of the 80s, where against the backdrop of folding Soviet project, uh, the artists were again focusing on landscape, soil, pre-modern cosmologies. So instead of going up towards cosmic exploration, like the classic version of modernity, and instead of the idea of supremacy of man, they, there was this uh, intuitive need to go down towards the black soil and empty landscapes and the need to feel them as if for the first time to start from the zero to redefine their relationship or a human's relationship with the space instead of conquering it. So even uh, in the most radical of the group's abstractions, be it Silvashi's rainfalls or Krivolap's entire body of work, there is this horizon line that organizes the pictorial world according to the familiar and very earthbound sense of space. So here the presence of landscapes or land as a subject matter or as a structuring element had a very distinct treatment for everyday participant of the group, while still remaining in very close connection to particular geographies. For example, Krivolab, who eventually settled in the village near Yahutin, and he established himself as the most recognized landscape abstractions of the time. So Yagatin was a particular place where, as he say, nature materializes as cosmos, while human beings are temporary. So this inspired a plethora of distinctively phenomenological work based on the artist's, artist's spatial, te spatial temporal perception. So again, my point being that it was very, the abstract paintings of each member of the group were very much linked to very particular uh, horizons, and I'll skip through some other works, for example, Zhivotkov, whose work were abstract, yet very much linked to Christian tradition. Um, and to, uh, to end, also, like, I want to bring up Alexander Babak. It's a very kind of particular example, as he and his partner, Tamara Babak, they both uh, relocated to the countryside in the aftermath of Chernobyl. And so they bought a house which was right next to a village of Lemkiv. And uh, the village, the peasants from that village were kind of relocated to Kolhozas uh, during the 60s. So by the time uh, Babak's family were living nearby, the village was already kind of, it went, uh, and, uh, it, it's like nearly dis um, uh, disappeared. So the village was abandoned because of collectivization and then kind of the nature was taking over it. And it's a very interesting comment again, as uh, to think about the kind of the modernity that happens and this kind of life after the modernity and the idea of the future collapsed. So it is this 
um, is, is here that he, uh, Alexander Babak, um, embarked on this lifelong journey of rediscovering the sense of human and the bound of the human to a land through clays, woods, soils that he would incorporate in his quasi-archaeological abstract sculptures and paintings. And perhaps the most representative uh, image for this movement was Babak's um, tender gesture of covering haystacks with massive canvases of abstract painting. Um, and to conclude, um, the years of the painterly preserve formative for the artists that attempted to find the absolute, to structure the chaos with the help of what they believed was the sacred capacity of raw paint. The group eventually was lost between this modernist vocabularies, which would not quite fit their own agenda that they were not able to articulate. But nevertheless, um, they grasped the sense of late Soviet stagnation and its narrative of the land while smoothly turning into the need for healing, not breaking. Reinforced by the disaster of Chernobyl and the geopolitical collapse of the opposition between East and West, Ukrainian abstract painting was a reverse modernism, as I called it, that drifted dramatically away from future-oriented progress back to the earthly narratives of the past. Thus, the painterly reserve evolved into an antithesis of its supposed agenda not using the landscape to protect abstract painting, but using the abstract painting to protect the landscape. Unsurprisingly, and um, a reunion that was initiated by Babak a decade after the birth of Painterly Preserve took place in the village and it was called the landscape. It was an exercise of peaceful contemplation to abstract lines of horizons, rivers and rains without any ur urgency of narratives of modernity. So I'll stop here and thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Asya. That was so um, such a rich talk. I love this idea of reverse modernism and this very specificity that you brought out in the Soviet Ukrainian artistic intelligentsia in their relationship to the land, right? And this sort of relationship to nature. I think that's just extremely important. And um, thank you so much. Um, I would like uh, Anastasia to say a few words. Thank you. I'll be uh, really short. Uh, first of all, thank you and Tasha for arranging and for uh, uh, making this event and presentation happen. Um, my huge gratitude goes to Olena for curating a wonderful exhibition and for editing this catalog and for all the contributors and authors uh, of this book. Um, Alisa, Asia, Alexander. Thank you, Alisa and Asia, for your brilliant presentations today. Uh, the Ukrainian Institute partnered with Rutgers University and Zimmerli Art Museum in 2019 uh, because we understood how important it is to, to make this show and this catalog uh, happen. And uh, um, as the responsible person on behalf of the Ukrainian Institute for this project from the very beginning, I can witness how many efforts it took uh, for Olena and all the organizers to actually make this exhibition come to life. Uh, and due to the pandemic restrictions, it had been delayed and rescheduled several times. Uh, but truly, um, I think that now at the time of Russian aggression and war in Ukraine, um, holding this exhibition and um, publishing and presenting the book about Ukrainian art is even more important. Uh, it is really important to give platforms for Ukrainian art to be exhibited, for Ukrainian voices to speak up in international platforms, and that's what we are actually doing right now, the Ukrainian Institute. Uh, the book uh, summarizes this enormous curatorial and intellectual work uh, um, done while preparing the exhibition and uh, highlights uh, uh, the unique peculiarities of uh, Ukrainian art and shows what is uh, why Ukrainian art stands up from the general title of Soviet art uh, from the Russian art and um, this is truly important uh, um, kind of mission of this book I think um, also it helps to understand 
what makes Ukrainian art so extraordinary and uh, how Ukrainian art contributed to global artistic processes at that time. Um, also, I'd like to say that all the uh, photographs, uh, the unique photographs and documents and artistic statements that are published in the book uh, also help uh, to discover this um, very vibrant spirit of Ukrainian art scene in Kyiv at that time. Um, and um, well, as we say, as Olena said, and I totally agree that it is very important right now to talk about Ukrainian art, to uh, talk about uh, the repressions and executions of Ukrainian artists and cultural workers in 30s and 60s, the executed Renaissance, the artistic movements of the 60s called Shistadesyatniki, uh, the uh, Mikhailo Buychuk and his school. Um, and uh, well, this journey through art history of Ukraine can help uh, Many people understand what uh, risk are Ukrainian uh, art professionals, artists, and culture in general uh, at right now, and uh, what are we actually fighting for? Uh, so thank you for for this wonderful presentation and uh, for making this publication happen. Thank you so much, Anastasia. Um, I think we would all agree that. Um, support for Ukrainian art, um, explaining Ukrainian art, talking about Ukrainian art is um, is urgent uh, right now and is definitely the cultural front. And um, this book is um, a very important piece of that. And so thank you so much to Elena and to all of our um, authors and presenters for, um, for making this possible and creating a new platform for further research as well. Um, I know we're running over, but I did want to highlight one question um, that I think speaks to future research, in fact. Um, Jennifer asks, where were women artists at the time Painterly Preserve was formed? How was their path taken them to today? And Asia responded, unfortunately, there were only men, at least those whose names were included in the list of participants in the catalogs. Um, so just very quickly in, in a minute or so, if, if any of you want to speak to women artists in this period, um, where, where should future researchers look? I can speak briefly because, uh, um, for instance, this group, um, the Resolute Edge of the National Post Eclecticism, um, it really was uh, uh, both uh, uh, a female and um, uh, male artists. And um, uh, Marina Skuvereva and Yana Bustrova, I'm just uh, absolutely uh, fascinated with uh, the technical aspects of their artwork and how a masterful, uh, truly masterful, uh, uh, their paintings were. And uh, uh, from that period, what Marina Skuvereva was doing uh, by combination of the em embroidery and uh, painting on canvas medium, uh, it, it's absolutely spectacular and also um, provides so much opportunity for further analysis uh, in my dissertation, I had a separate chapter on female artists and uh, uh, also not mentioned here because she was from Odessa, Larissa Zvezdashotova, Rizun Zvezdashotova. Um, uh, I, I believe that uh, this period of the 80s, early 90s gave a really um, uh, more really important uh, uh, female artists and uh, uh, there is, um, well, a big uh, opportunity to study them and uh, because the material is totally totally worth it wonderful asia uh yes thank you i just want to quickly add um that for example there were i mean there were many women artists but then there was this thing um that you know um there was this kind of separation there is painting and this kind of decorative art and for example i i was uh, i mentioned alexander babak in my uh, who was a participant of painterly preserve but his lifelong partner, Tamara Babak, and so they were with it, together, they moved to that village and they, like she was always part of those. And she does amazing work with like what is called decorative art and like working with woods and all this other type of like media. But uh, again, somehow like I was focusing 
exclusively on ho those who were included in this group back then and those were only men. But if one wants to make this research, there would be like a whole kind of problematizing of this situation. Like there were all these women and they were doing work which was kind of not qualified for like, uh, you know, if you don't do painting that you, you cannot speak of the art, art because art uh, painting is the highest form of like thinking in visual terms. But there's definitely women, they were just kind of like uh, put in a different niche uh, or maybe, I mean, they, and I know uh, other artists who were working at that time and they would kind of, uh, they would not even try to be part of that discussion. They would be just like working with ceramics or tapestry or whatever. But maybe Alisa wants to add something because she definitely knows more about that period of time when women artists I actually think that you are absolutely right, and uh, that's a very relevant and, and good uh, observation. Yes, uh, we. Um, I, I just wanted to recommend, uh, if somebody is interested, there is this uh, awesome book uh, published by Pinchuk Art Center as a result of their uh, exhibition of uh, Ukrainian female artists. It's called Why There Are Great uh, Ukraine Female Artists in Ukraine. Uh, it was uh, edited by, by our colleague and friend uh, Katerina Yakovlenko, who was Antasha, uh, uh, I think. Think, uh, scholar for a while last year and uh, yeah so 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 there are there are women artists there are books about women artists and they are even in English so in case you're interested you can google it because uh, throughout the history of Ukrainian art yes there was this uh, there was this huge, uh, huge problem of this uh, patriarchal uh, uh, socialist realism, uh, which uh, was uh, like uh, only sometimes uh, interrupted by uh, female voices. But in Ukraine, compared to other Soviet countries, for instance, there was much stronger school of uh, female art. And I, I even sometimes like receive some, 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 some messages from Russian artists and art historians, like used to before this whole situation regarding uh, like, oh, you guys had female artists your your art is so like you have Tatiana Iblonska you have like a uh, Ala Horska you have uh, Tatiana Halimbievska all those superstars uh, of uh, art uh, in Soviet time and uh, which were well known uh, uh, well uh, across the borders even and uh, so so yeah and after the collapse of the Soviet Union I think even when we uh, started like dealing with Ukrainian art with Olena it was back in 2000 I think one or two uh, and and uh, when we just uh, just uh, just entered the art scene, it was still uh, very male uh, oriented. Like women were only like perceived as a service. I think I, I still am the victim of that uh, of that <laughs> situation because you were like you were positioned in a very narrow niche as a you could either be a muse uh for this like you know genius or you could be a service like a manager not even a curator you, you had to earn the right to be a curator because you you mainly were like the service service uh horse uh, who who had to to run as much as uh, you can and it's it was still very uh, very obvious i mean it wasn't that bad it's not that somebody like persecuted us or or did something bad to us but it was uh, it was very obvious that like uh, a male uh, voice was a completely different thing but then it very quickly changed because even like uh, with the artists who came to the scene in uh, early like in 2004 and afterwards there was also already a completely different dynamics and even then like I remember how Vlada Ralko, one of the most uh, prominent Ukrainian artists emerged on the scene and it was like it was rather smooth for her at least somehow somehow she immediately gained uh, this uh, you know ability to to speak and uh, her voice was heard and uh, it was it's so it was complicated it was not so one like it was like I think it was just this long echo of this patriarchal uh, Soviet system. Uh, again, what we were speaking about that they didn't like admit that they were the heirs of that system. But in many like even everyday banal this uh, uh, situations and uh, in their attitudes they were still adhering to that uh, that system where you like you know you. 
oh, you're so beautiful, you have to inspire us, you know, all that stuff, which is like, which which for many women, like, who, who came to the scene was actually very, very, very problematic because as, as an, it's, it's very hard to earn this, like, you know, right to be an even independent scholar in such a situation. But now it's completely changed. I mean, we have to admit, there are still some traces here and there, but I think that uh, now there is even harder to find, I think, males in our art uh, system than, than females but in again like it's the question like but still uh if you are a manager uh, there are more female managers than 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 male managers but still there are probably more male artists than female but but this still the ratio changed a lot and i i think it's a very good good thing um, that's really fascinating, Alyssa. Just there's a question from um, George Grabovich about um, comparative approaches and work being done comparing the art scene with other art forms. And Alyssa, just what what you were saying reminded me so much about theater and um, uh, sort of the issues with gender in theater and that sort of most directors tended to be male, right? Most of the sort of artistic directors tended to be male and, you know, sort of women were supposed to be the actresses inspiring the manifestos, right? And, and the work, um, but, but not necessarily directing themselves. And there's been a complete change, right? In the theatrical scene in, in Ukraine. So I think it'd be interesting to think about gender across all of these art forms, right? And comparative approaches. Um, that way. So um, there was also a question about Jewish artists, which Olena answered, um, looking at Alexander Reutberg, right, would be a, a, a wonderful um, way to sort of open um, uh, into that world. And I would like to also mention the question by Helena Hrin, who says, how can the Shevchenko Scientific Society best help in furthering the cause of Ukrainian art? So perhaps we could end on a wish that you all would have for Entesha. What can Entesha do to further the cause of Ukrainian art? We can have presentations, we can talk about work, we can, we can talk about your work, we can mention your work, we can buy the catalog, we can have our libraries buy the catalog. Um, what can we do? Oh. Well, I just wanted to say that, for instance, uh, recently I received, uh, well, Timberley Museum received an offer uh, for this exhibition to travel uh, to the Coral Gables Museum in um, Florida. And, uh, uh, well, I'm, I'm afraid to jinx it, but uh, hopefully it will work out. And uh, I'm, I'm just throwing this idea also in this uh, space space, so to speak. So maybe um, members of um, uh, Shevchenko Scientific Society will have uh, some ideas of uh, where uh, this exhibition, even in truncated form, could be presented. And uh, uh, since, uh, for instance, right now there are several art loans um, um, from Ukraine, and we obviously cannot return these artworks right now, uh, but uh, uh, the show could travel. Uh, in the US, maybe it can be shown in New York. Uh, so uh, that, that would be a, a great help if uh, some ideas of this will arise. Wonderful, wonderful. And let's Trimay Mukulaki for Coral Gables, Florida. Um, that would be really wonderful for me, especially since I live in Florida. Um, so uh, I know we've gone over, but I think it's worth it. I think this has been an incredibly important conversation and presentation. And I want to thank our presenters so deeply for, um, for being with us today and for also creating this um, incredibly important and timely um, piece of work that, that, I, that I think will inspire more research and um, that fills a gap um, and, and that for which we're extremely grateful. Um, so thank you so much. Um, I miss you. I miss you all. I wish I could just hug you all right now. Um, and thank you so much to all of our listeners um, and those who will watch the recording later. Uh, thank you so much to Christina Conroy for making this possible um, on the back end with the IT. And thank you so much to Antasha for creating this series of webinars and amplifying Ukrainian voices and Ukrainian culture. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.